Welcome back to another episode of Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about the different methods of purification that are available to us. So when you're doing lab work, you quite often need to isolate pure substances. Now there could be very many different reasons that you're doing this, but one of the main ones is that you're trying to confirm the identity of a compound. Maybe you just need to purify it before you move on. Another consideration is that if you're using a mixture of substances, it can be challenging to know what's going on. However, if you have a controlled number of substances, you can predict more easily what's taking place. Sometimes you can know everything that goes into a reaction and still not know what's happening, but this can be simplified if you're using a less complex mixture of compounds. So the main thing that we can do to exploit the differences between these substances is to look at their physical properties and consider the differences between the components of our mixture. And so some classes include volatility, solubility, polarity, charge, density, phase, basicity, and acidity, size, interactions with stationary phases, derivatizability, magnetism, and finally viscosity. So volatility is basically a method that you can separate stuff based on their boiling point. So here's an example where you can see a distillation occurring through uh, a, an increased number of plates. This is called a Vigro column, which can be good at separating different uh, compounds. So here you can see on the bottom there's more and more yellow, but as we get higher up it gets clearer and clearer. In this case, I was separating xylene from methyl thionobenzoate, and xylene had a tendency to co-distill with the methyl thionobenzoate, even though it had quite a high boiling point. So one of the methods is distillation. This can take place in many different forms. Now, I'm not trying to talk about all the different forms of distillation today, but just to identify that there's different techniques at our disposal. Another method is to do Kugelrohr or reduced pressure distillation. A Kugelrohr is a specialized apparatus used for isolating these compounds, uh, such as viscous oils that are not relatively... Uh, volatile, but they are still volatile enough that if you get a low enough vacuum, you can do a trap-to-trap -trap distillation. Steam distillation also exists where you can use water and you can co-distill compounds with water. Additionally, instead of using water, you could use nitrogen or a different gas to assist the distillation. So normally at atmospheric pressure, we have one atmosphere, but if we do a reduced pressure, it could be easier to get stuff to distill in the case of reduced pressure distillation because the the vapor pressure of the compound at the given temperature can be lower than atmospheric pressure. Now, if we have a mixture of gases, we don't need to reach atmospheric pressure for stuff to distill over. So you can just use a gas to assist with that. Now, you can also do preparative GC. That stands for gas chromatography. And so you can slowly separate a small amount of material on a GC and isolate it that way. Now, this is not that ideal because it can be really challenging to isolate useful amounts of stuff with preparative GC. Additionally, you can do azeotropic distillation. This is quite frequently used to remove water from stuff. You can use toluene for that, for instance. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is solubility. So you can separate stuff very easily using differences in their solubility. So here you can see this is a solution of xylenes, which has been cooled to room temperature, and as it cools, Lawson's reagent is precipitating out of it. Now, one of the things you can do is extract uh, stuff from one phase to another using a two-solvent or a two-phase system. This is quite often done with water as well as an organic solvent, although you can use two different organic solvents such as ether and DMSO or pentane and acetonitrile. It's also possible to do trituration. So let's say you have a solid residue and you don't want to do a two-phase uh, two system with water and an organic solvent. Let's say instead you just wanted to have the residue and extract with the solvent. So you can do that several times and that's called trituration. You can also do crystallization, as stuff will be more or less soluble, so if you can saturate a solution and then the solution slowly evaporates or becomes super saturated, stuff can often crystallize out. It's also possible to separate stuff out using centrifugation. So if there is an increased force downwards in the case of centrifugation, the solubility of stuff can often change, which is why you can often crash stuff out of solution. So it's interesting to think about solubility as a factor related to gravity as well, because, you know, in principle, if everything's suspended in zero G, there's not going to be any driving force for stuff to precipitate out other than um, disfavored interactions. It's also possible to separate stuff that has differing solubility via filtration. So we can filter a solution to get stuff out that way. It's also possible to precipitate stuff out. Um, sometimes we don't get crystals. Sometimes we just get amorphous precipitate. So another consideration is the polarity of molecules, and this basically just considers uh, several different factors present in molecules, such as dipole moments in given portions of a molecule, the, the bulk properties of the molecule, etc. And so some techniques that work for this include flash chromatography, gas chromatography, thin layer chromatography, which is just like flash chromatography but in a 2D instead of a 3D system, High-precision liquid chromatography, HPLC, liquid chromatography, uh, LC. 
and finally extraction. So this is essentially the preferential solubility between two phases. Something could be soluble in both phases, but it could be preferentially soluble in one versus the other, one in similar polarity, for instance. So another factor is charged. And so here we can see a picture of an electrophoresis gel. Uh, I want to credit Scorp from the Discord for providing this image that they allowed me to use. If you're interested in talking to them, you can join the Discord. And so there's several different variants of electrophoresis. I'm not going to go into detail about all the different ones here, but because there's different ways to separate stuff, I thought it would be worth highlighting some of the techniques that biologists use, as chemists might also benefit from utilizing these tools, including centrifugation. ICP is a technique often used for analytical purposes, but in principle it could be used uh, preparatively, uh, although I wasn't able to confirm that people do this regularly. Additionally, in Q-traps or related mass spectrometers, there's uh, quadrupoles which are able to uh, move stuff with different mass depending on its mass to charge ratio. And so in principle, if something's charged, you can move it that way. You see that in Maldi-Toff, for instance. Additionally, you can utilize the charge by uh, acidifying or basifying a compound. Um, stuff that's going to be more charged is usually going to be more soluble in polar stuff, while neutral stuff is going to be more soluble in non-polar solvents. Additionally, you can use ion exchange, depending on the charge. So the next thing I want to talk about is density. So one of the things you can do is you can centrifuge stuff out. So in the enrichment of uranium, for instance, uranium hexafluoride uh, has a different density for the isotope of uranium 235 versus 238. And so the centrifugation of uranium hexafluoride is typically done uh, to isolate enriched uranium, which is just more 235. So that's one example. But additionally, let's say that you have some precipitate that's floating on top of your solution that would have a higher dense or that would have a lower density. Alternatively, you could have a dense precipitate, which is more dense than your solution, which would be on the bottom of the solution. And so you can centrifuge it off. Alternatively, if it's more dense uh, and the solid's just sitting on the bottom, you can just decant off the liquid. Um, and finally, you can do flotation. This is often used in the purification of minerals using a flotation agent such as potassium ethyl xanthate. Another consideration is phase. So here's an example where you can see a solution has some precipitate in it, and you can see that the solid precipitate is a solid while the liquid is a liquid, and you can see that a clear solution comes through from a cloudy brown solution. So some methods you can do include filtration, condensation such as distillation, you can distill stuff from one place to another, sublimation, soxlet extraction, crystallization, and melting. Another consideration is basicity, so if you, or acidity, if something's more basic or less basic, you could do different extractions to extract it. So for instance, alkaloids that are derived from organisms such as plants are usually extracted after being treated with something like base, which is alkaline. And then the organic solvent that extracts all of the alkali components are called, like contain the alkaloids. And so usually because bioactive stuff contains nitrogens, in plants, these are often protonated, but if you treat it with a base, it will deprotonate them, make them into their free base form, which can be extracted using an organic solvent. Additionally, it's possible to crystallize or precipitate stuff depending on whether or not it's protonated. So let's say you had, uh, in this case, the protonated amine that's in the plant, but you want to make it soluble. So you could just treat it with a base. That's an example of you know a way to make it soluble. But then let's say you wanted to recrystallize it. You want to re-precipitate it. You could treat it with an acid again, and it no longer will want to be soluble in the organic solution. Now, depending on your organic solvent, it might still be soluble. But here we can see an example of a slow crystallization occurring. Now, two final things to consider include the exploitation of size. So size exclusion chromatography is a technique often used by biologists as well as polymer chemists to isolate stuff based on their size. Additionally, dialysis can be used. Now this typically isn't used in a research context, although it conceivably could be, where if you have, for instance, kidney failure, you need to remove some toxic metabolites that are present in the blood. And so because those are low molecular weight molecules, their small size is able to pass through a semi-permeable membrane. Now, a couple other things to discuss include the use of interaction with the stationary phase. So here we can see a chromatography column. This is a silica column. This is actually the separation of methyl thionobenzoate. And alternatives to this include thin, thin layer chromatography. Other stationary phases, such as alumina, can be used, but most commonly silica is used. 
Additionally, if you wanted to isolate E versus Z alkenes and these weren't separating well in a typical column, you could use a silver nitrate on silica column. These can be really useful and these aren't widely adopted, but those who've tried them know how insanely useful they are. You can usually get several minutes of resolution between compounds this way. Additionally, if you're having trouble with normal silica, you can use reverse phase silica. And so this is just functionalized silica with some sort of lipophilic tail. Um, GC also works, gas chromatography as some analytes will also have differing boiling points, they can also have differing interactions with the column material itself, and so some stuff will stay longer. Additionally, HPLC can work, and this kind of works by the same principle, which is basically just reverse phase uh, silica anyway. Finally, you can do liquid chromatography, which just follows the same trend as the rest of these. With uh, SEC, you can also do this, um, as while previously we were talking about it as the size being a major factor, because the stationary phase will have small pores, smaller stuff can get stuck, while the bigger molecules can keep flowing through. And so those small molecules are interacting with the stationary phase. Now, another consideration is derivatizability. And so there's a couple different things you can do. So let's say you have a mixture of enantiomers, but you want to get a crystal of a single one of the enantiomers. So brucine is a chiral amine that's available in the pool of al plant alkaloids. Now, if you protonate brucine with something like a carboxylic acid, let's say you have a racemic mixture, because brucine is already chiral, you should be able to crystallize just one of the enantiomers out more easily than the other. Additionally, if you wanted to purify aldehydes, for example, it's possible to use bisulfite as these form adducts with the aldehydes. And so you can partition this to the aqueous phase, um, while the remaining organic should stay in the organic layer. Another consideration is solid phase immobilization. So this is colloquially known as bead chemistry. If you have a bead with an end that you can do chemistry on, you can essentially do chemical manipulations to the end of the bead, uh, and you just do this stepwise one at a time, and then right at the end, you can cleave it off of the bead using whatever technique is available for that given type of bead, and then isolate your final stuff. And then you don't have to worry about you know washing and losing your stuff too, too much because it's stuck to the bead the whole time. It's also possible to make a derivative by protonating or basifying, as I was stating earlier. Additionally, you can form insoluble salts. So let's say you're trying to isolate sodium carbonate, and that was water soluble, but you wanted to make it insoluble. So you could make it into the calcium salt. Calcium carbonate's insoluble, it will precipitate. However, there's many other examples of possible transformations you could do. One other consideration is magnetism. So if you wanted to separate iron powder or nickel powder from a mixture of non-magnetic powders, you'd be able to just pull out all the magnetic ones. And as long as there's enough of a chance for the non-magnetic stuff to fall out of the mixture, this can be accomplished. Additionally, there's some DNA purification protocols where DNA is able to bind to magnetic uh, iron oxide nanoparticles. And so these particles can then uh, you know, be magnetically attracted and the, the supernatant can be decanted. The final thing I want to mention is viscosity can be utilized. So let's say you have a mixture of compounds. Some are more viscous, some are less viscous. If you pour this over a surface, the more viscous stuff will run more slowly, while the less viscous stuff can run out. And so this was used in some very early purifications, and it's a technique that's still conceivable to use to this day. And so I hope that this has been a useful lecture discussing the different methods of purifying compounds. It would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed, and I hope you have a wonderful day.